Okay, we're here. Adar, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Megillas Esther. All right, welcome back. Thank you, everyone. I hear Rabbi Lamb told me that you guys, what? What do you need? The clip's on. Oh, the paper. Okay, we're learning Ili Nishmat Tichil, Yisrael, Michael Ben, Fula, Harari. Michael Ben Fula Harari. And the initials Leo Ben Chana. What does it say? Doctory? Oh, Doctory. Doctory. Good, very good. Okay, I think that's better. Um, not on yet, not on yet. Okay, what's the name of Fu Shalema? Or Shlomo Eliezer Ben Chayasar Elka. The initials. What? I live in Rochel and the initials of Yimori Yitzhak Ben Chabashul Akoin. Yes? That's it? We're done? Okay. All right, so it's a big chiddush what I'm going to say tonight. I've, I've been learning for a very long time. Gilas Esther is one of my favorite subjects. Anyone who's heard my poem, sure knows that. And, and really, what everyone, I was just listening to um, on the way here, it's 97.5, there was someone speaking, and everyone has their, their take on, on what's the main thing of, that we learn out of Purim. And I always learned that it was Nister. That, that, that the, whole, the whole miracle of Purim, it doesn't say Hashem's name once. And it could be really just a Persian story, you know, a king, and he had a wife, and then he killed her. Then he found another wife, and there was all types of uh, stuff going on behind the scenes. They had this in every empire, in every, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, Caesar, right? They killed him, Itu Brute. I mean, every empire had, you know, murders and, and, and murderers and Bix and Viserys and... It, it, it could be, you know, it would have been a good movie, would have been a good Broadway play, would have been a good book, you know, a king, and his wife didn't listen to him, and he killed her, and he married a beautiful girl, and she said, kill this guy, because he's after everybody, so he killed that guy, and Mordechai was, was in the government. If you read it as a story, it doesn't, Hashem is not here at all whatsoever. And the basis of Hashem hiding his name is that we always read Pasha Tetzava next week, right? It's Pasha Tetzava, always right before Purim, because it's very interesting how a person, how we, each one of us, has the power to force Hashem's hands. How? How? Moshe Rabbeinu in Pasha Tetzava, so his name is not mentioned. In the whole Pasha Tetzava, it doesn't say the word Moshe ever, once. So we all know why not, because after the ego, Hashem said, I want to destroy Klai and Moshe Rabbeinu said, what did he say? He said, if you destroy Klai Israel, wipe my name out. In other words, okay, there's a whole story about Gilgulim here. Moshe Rabbeinu was a Gilgul of Noach, right? And by Noach, there's a whole thing of, was he an Ish Tzadik? Wasn't he an Ish Tzadik? So the reason that he wasn't an Ish Tzadik is because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they used to always say to me, at the end of the day, I used to come home after a hockey game, and I would tell my father, the ice was very, very wet. It was very warm. It wasn't good ice. You couldn't really fly on the ice. The ref was much cheating for the other side, right? At the end of the day, did you win or lose? At the end of the day, I hear all the excuses, and we know once you come home with excuses, right? My father used to always tell me, if you have an excuse, I don't need to know. I know you lost. Nobody ever came home and said, you want to hear the excuse why we won? Doesn't happen. When, when you're making excuses, I wasn't prepared uh, with the ref, and uh, that, you lost. That's always, anyone who makes excuses means you lost, otherwise you don't make excuses, right? So, so at the end of the day, Noah, did you save the world? No. Everyone died but you and your family. It's tzaddik, you were a tzaddik, you weren't doing what everybody else was doing, but at the end of the day, did you save my world? The answer is no, you didn't save my world, you lost. So the Ish Sadiq, that he was good, right, that he was good, he was good, he wasn't like everyone else, but he didn't save the world. And that's why he had to come back to this world again. Because at the end of the day, living this life is not about saving yourself. This life is about saving the world and saving, and saving others. There was a guy today, today, it was either today or yesterday on the news, a soldier who got the highest medal of honor that an American soldier can get. He wasn't such an old guy, was, right? 
And so when they were saying, they were talking about it, I was wondering, what did this guy do? Like, did he go in there and, like, just guns blazing and knock out a whole Afghanistan unit? Like, what did he do? So the president, it's the highest medal of honor. You, a soldier can't get a higher medal of honor. So the president gave it to him today. I think it was today. And, and what was the medal of honor? He went in, like, his whole unit got blown apart, and, like, 14 guys got killed. And he went in and retrieved every single body that they should be buried. So he retrieved every single soldier in his unit that got killed. He went in again on, on enemy fire. He wasn't going to save live soldiers. He was going to make sure that the, Afghan, that the Muslims didn't desecrate the bodies. So he, he said, I heard, and then I didn't hear it anymore in the news, because I got a phone call, that he saved 14 bodies, whatever it was. So he could have saved himself. He, he went in there in enemy fire. He got the highest medal of honor, not for saving himself. You don't get a medal of honor for saving yourself. You get a medal of honor for saving others. So at the end of the day, Noah, you're a great man. The world went down on your watch. Yirmiyahu, the Beis Hamidrash was destroyed on his watch. And even though he warned Kleistro for years and years and years, the end is coming, the end is coming, the end is coming, the end is coming, and they didn't listen to him, and they laughed at him, and ended up getting destroyed. It wasn't his fault, but when he went to the Abbas of Asenu in the Medrash Eicha, and he said, Help! You know, and they said, who are you? And he said, Yimmy, yo, you? On your watch? The base of just got destroyed. Get out of here. What? What do you want from me? I told them I, I, I was the Navi. End of the day. You're the coach? End of the day. You're the coach? And the, and the NFL and the football team went 0-12? Yeah, this guy was on drugs. This guy got hurt. Your quarterback got his broken wrist. And you had all replacements. At the end of the day, what kind of record did you bring me? 0-12, you're fired. That's because that's your job. When you're the leader, at the end of the day, you've got to get it done. So, Noach didn't get it done. Yemiyahu didn't get it done. Yeshayahu didn't get it done. So they were all punished. So, he had to come back. Now, we know, in a Gilgal, when you come back, you have the same test the same test, exactly the same test that you had last time, and you got to pass it. Last time you failed, it's a retest. It's like, can you, Rebbe, can you give me another retest? It's a retest. So you come back and you end up in the same position. So what happened? Hashem came to Moshe Rabbeinu, and he said, this was Noach. Don't forget, this is the Nisham of Noach. And he said to Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, they made the Egel, I'm destroying. I am destroying the whole Klai Yisrael, but you, I will save with your family, and the new nation of Klai Yisrael will come out of you. Exactly what happened, Noah. I'll destroy the whole world. You and your family will come out of the ark. And from you will come the whole world. The last time he flunked. This time he said, no. He said, I'm not making the same mistake again. He said, Mecheni no misifracha. He said, if they go down, I go down. Maybe that's what Noah had to say. Maybe if Noah would have said to God, Teva Shmeva, I don't want no Teva. I don't want no Teva. I don't want no animals in my Teva. I don't want to be saved with my family. If you destroy the world, destroy me and my family and the animals and everything, all of us. I, don't, I can't say, but maybe Hashem would have said, okay, okay, then I won't destroy the world. But he never said that. No, he never said that to Hashem. He never said it's all or nothing. Moshe Rabbeinu said, if they go, then you take my name out of your Chumash. No Shmos, no Bayikra, no Bamidbar, no Devarim. You want to keep Bereshit because I'm not in there? Fine. But those four books, I go, they go. And Hashem said, in that case, I'll keep them all. Now if you take the word Mecheni, spells, if you flip the letters around, Mei Noach, Mem Ches Non Yud. May Noach, the waters of Noach. He said, Mocheni no I am being misakein. I am fixing what Noach did wrong. Then may Noach erase what happened in the reigns of Noach when the world was destroyed and I didn't save it. And that was, that was Moshe Rabbeinu's tikkun for, for what happened. So when I was... So what happened was, Pashas Tzavah, Hashem doesn't mention his name because when a tzaddik says something, 
right? When he says something, Hashem has to take at least something of what he said and make it come true. So Hashem had to erase him. Somewhere in Shemot Vayikra he had to be erased. So he's erased in Pashas Titzava. There's no mention of his name. So Hashem said, if a human being, if a human being is ready to erase his name, I'm giving him a chance, imagine, the whole Jewish nation is going to come from his family. Right? And all the Jews are going to die. His family, Moshe Rabbeinu, all of us, are going to come straight from Moshe Rabbeinu, which would mean that everybody would be Shevet Levi. I don't know what you do when you have a problem on Shabbos. Right? Because you're either a Levi or a Kayan if you're coming from Moshe Rabbeinu. But every, he said no. So this is what it says in the Medrash, that Hashem said, in that case, if a man is willing to wipe his name out of my whole Torah to save the Jews, then I surely, I'm God, I surely have to wipe my name out to save the old Jews. So my name will not be written in the Megillah. In the greatest saving of the Jewish nation, you will not see my name. And he is hidden, he is hidden in the whole book of Megillah's Esther. But Moshe Rabbeinu is also hidden. In the, now, we know, that, that we'll talk about it a little bit tonight, the Zayar says that every time it says the word Melech, that's why we have, we have Megillah, so I didn't bring it with me, where the top of every page says HaMelech. Any time it says HaMelech without the word Achashverosh, it's talking about God. So even though it doesn't say God's name, when it says HaMelech in the Megillah, and it doesn't say Achashverosh, it's talking about Hashem's name. So Hashem is, and I'll show it to you, Hashem's name is hidden in the Megillah, but it's not, it's not Nigla, you don't see it. Moshe Rabbeinu's name, the Vilna I believe what the Vilna says, is also hidden in the, in the Pasha Tetzave. How? If you take the amount of psukim, I don't remember exactly how I got to this, but I know it exists. If you take the amount of psukim, there are a hundred and one, right? That's right. There's a hundred and one. There are 101 psukim in the Pasha Tzavah. Now, the name that you see when you say Moshe, you see a mem, a mem, you see a shin, right? And you see a hey. That's what you see. Moshe. What's the hidden part of Moshe's name? A mem, how is it spelled a mem? Mem, mem. So you see the first mem, but you don't see the second mem, because that's how spelled mem. So you have a mem that's hidden. Shin, yud nun. So now, you have a mem, from the word mem, right? So you have a mem that you see and a mem that you don't see. You spell mem, mem, mem. So that's 40. Shin you see, but the yud, shin, yud, shin yud nun, you don't see the yud nun. What's yud nun? 60. What's 60 and 40? 100. Hey, how do you spell hey? Hey aleph. You see the hey, but you don't see the aleph. So the hidden letters in the word Moshe equal 101. The amount of psukim in the word in the Pasha Tetzava is 101. So Moshe's name is hidden. In you know, anyone who doesn't believe in like the Torah and stuff like this, like, how did this happen? I mean, come on. There are 101 psukim, and Moshe's hidden letters equals 101. You, you can't just say, like, come on, some guy made this up. That's crazy. 101 psukim. And, the, and, the, and, the, and in, in, in the Megillah, which I'm going to show you something really crazy, in the Megillah. God's name is also hidden. In Perek Vav, there's a story that I, I say every single year. So I taught in Crown Heights Yeshiva. Crown Heights Yeshiva is a school for kids who are not religious. The kids are not religious. Mostly Israeli homes, and they're all not religious. So you don't expect Ruch HaKodesh coming in your, six, in your sixth grade class from some kid who, doesn't, who eats you know, lobster and doesn't keep shops. But a Jewish neshama is a Jewish neshama. So I'm sitting there. This is... 25 years ago, maybe 30, no, 30 years ago. And I'm teaching sixth grade, that's before I hit eighth grade, so it's gotta be 35 years, I was 20 years old, I was 21 years old. And I'm, we're talking about, like I'm telling you guys, that, 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 that the, the word HaMelech stands for Hashem's name. Now the Medrash says, which I'll read you inside tonight, some crazy Medrashim, beautiful Medrashim. The Medrash says that in Perek Vav, when it says that the king could not sleep, by the way, the king, over there, it's talking about God because it doesn't say Hamelech Achishverosh. It says the king could not sleep, Hashem could not sleep. There's a lush in Hashem. So the word not sleeping is used by God. It doesn't mean he's sleeping. The, 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 the Medrash in, by Paro, 
Paro, no, who said Hashem was sleeping? Vuchanetza? No, Paro. Your king is sleeping. Maybe it was Haman. I'm not sure. Huh? It's, a, it's like we have said to Achshver, that God is, God is sleeping. But anyway, in Perek Vav, it says the following, Balailahu, Noradosh Nasa Melech, that night the king could not sleep. So the Medrash says it's talking about Hashem, and his, his Racham, his Racham, his Midas Rachamim of pity could not sleep, right? So the kid raises his hand. He goes, Rebbe, I have to tell you something. I'm like, what? He goes, so it says that that was the beginning that was the beginning of our saving. Until then, Haman was very, very strong. That night, he couldn't sleep. They took out the book of Zechoinus. They saw that, that Mordechai saved the king. So the king said to Haman, you're going to lead Mordechai in my crown and everything else. That's when everything reversed. He came home to his... He lost his daughter. She jumped out the window. She poured the garbage, the toilet on Haman's head. He came home to his wife and he said, we're in big trouble. It seems to be that all the mazel, he was a big mazel guy, the whole mazel just changed tonight. So, so the, the beginning, and, 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 and I think it's Rabbi Akiva, we do, Rav Shem Baichoy, says that you, have, you should really begin the Megillah of Balai Lahu. Because if you don't read Balai Lahu, that's when our Geula came, right? So he raises his hand, he says, Rabbi, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? He says, if you count in chapter 6, Perik Vav, the amount of times that it says the word HaMelech, it says it 26 times. Yud Kei Vav Kei. Hashem's name is hidden in Perik Vav, where the beginning of the saving of Klai Yisrael happened. 26 times, which is the gematria of Hashem's real name, Yud Kei Vav Kei Rachamim. I said, no way. First of all, why would a kid in sixth grade count? I didn't, tell, I didn't, I didn't know that. I just said, Amalek is, is a secret way of saying Hashem's name. Why would a kid in sixth grade count? And then, of course, we counted every other Perik to see if any other ones had 26 Amalek. No. Just Perik Vav. Because Perik Vav was the beginning of the, of the miracle. So, so my whole speech every single year was that what you learn from the Gilas Esther and from Purim and why you wear a mask is to find the hidden God. Also to find the hidden you. What's in you that's hidden. Right? It's just, it's just, a, it's just a yontif of the hidden. Every other yontif is of the, of the nigla, of what we see, right? You have Hanukkah, candle is supposed to light one day, lit eight days, put it in the window. So that's a miracle that we saw. Pesach, crazy miracles that we saw. Shavuos, getting the Torah, right? Sukkot, traveling. The Anayinah HaKavai, we saw all this stuff. So every holiday that we have, right, are holidays of things that we saw. This is the miracle of finding the hidden things in life that we don't see finding within ourselves the potential and the koyach that we don't see. And that's why it's a minog to drink wine on Purim because what happens when you drink wine, nichnas yayin, yoytzei soid. When you drink wine, you get drunk, all your secrets come out. What are your secrets? The stuff that you're not, that you're not what's a secret? Something you're not in contact with. I have a secret, it's not something I'm in contact with every day, right? So, so when a person drinks wine, he goes inside himself, and he actually finds who he really is. I'm not telling you to drink wine. It's just on Purim and the Kedusha, right? But you go inside yourself. And so it's not only finding Hashem, his secret of Hashem. It's also finding the secret of who you are. That, that, that there's a part of you that says, Or Mordechai. And there is, I really want to talk about this next week. But I don't know if I'll be here next week. But I might, wherever I'm going to be, I might talk from there. So it'll be on Torah anytime. But... Lamaisa, in all of us, there's a, a Baruch Haman, there's a, eh, some bad stuff ain't so bad. You know, Haman's not, you know, the Averis and the Yitzhara, yeah, a couple of movies, a couple of this, a couple of sins, eh, it's not so bad. There's a little, there's a little Baruch Haman in, in doing some bad stuff. And you know, all the tyrant mitzvahs and all this stuff, there's a little Aramar Chai when you get inside yourself. I'm not so happy getting up every morning, putting on my tefillin, a little bit less. I'm Shemir saying, Nay, we just went straight with him. I can't look at this, I can't look at that. It's not all so great. But you won't go there when you're sober. You're not going to go there. But if you really go into, inside yourself, and I'm putting you go inside yourself, you're like, you know what? Sometimes I say, Baruch Haman, 
Like, that was great, man. I don't care, you know. That was a lot of fun. You know, it was wrong, but hey, it was great. And, and the truth is that, that I myself deal with this because real tshuva on something you did wrong, real tshuva, then when you go back to what you did wrong, you hate, you hate yourself for it. Not, 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 not you get depressed. You, you're just like, that was really, you, you feel like you did something wrong. When you talk about your bad stuff as a kid, you get together with your friends, and you're like, remember we did this? Remember we did that? And you know, we went to the casino. We did that. Remember what she looked like? Oh my God, you remember that, right? When you go there and, you're, and you don't feel bad about it, it means you didn't really do a, a chew with this little baruch haman. It was good, man. You know, well, it was, you know I'm excited now, but you know, that was really... Then you didn't, you didn't do your, you didn't do your kulei chuva. Because kulei chuva means that I go back and I realize that, that it was wrong and that it's, it's not happy about it. I'm not talking to my friends about the stuff I did bad. I'm not talking to my friends about when I failed the test. So why are you talking about when you failed your test on a spiritual level? And I'm still, I'm still not there. In my gambling days, there are still times that I'll still talk about and say, that was a crazy night. What I made that night, what I tipped that night, guys, you know, and... I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And, and, and there are times I'm going down the Garden State Parkway, going to Lakewood, and I'm like, wow, the 100 mile marker, I'm just 60 minutes away. And so that means, you, that means you, you're still a little bit Baruch Haman. It's like, it was good. You know, it were good nights. We, we, we did well, you know. And sometimes my friends still, we, we, you know, we laugh about it. And as long as you laugh about it and it was still good, you didn't do a Kulay Tshuva. You didn't do a whole Tshuva. So in all of us, there's this Baruch Haman. This, like, you know, enjoying the other stuff I'm not supposed to do. And there's an Aramana, if, you, if you're real, man, if you're really real with yourself. And there's an Aramana, like, you know, it's very nice, but, you know, uh, I'm not so happy about doing that mitzvah. You know, give it up, aim. I don't get along with my parents. And I got to call them every Shabbos. And I, and I, and I, and I got to, you know, I got to do give it up, aim, even though they treat me like garbage and they were abusive. And I still have to do this. And I'm not so happy about it. So you don't want to admit that. But when you're when you're in, in the Yayan and you're sitting on Purim, yeah. Yeah, there's a little aura, there's a little aura marcha and a little baruch haman. And it says you can get to the point where you don't know the difference. Ha uh ha. -huh. We don't know the difference between what's good and what's bad. What's bad is good, what's good is bad, you enjoy what's bad, you don't enjoy what's good. You can get to that point where you mamish don't know the difference between aura aura marcha and baruch as you're all and you're and you're all mixed up. And actually they're exactly the same numerical value. Do you know that? Baruch Haman equals exactly the Gematria Baruch Malachai. So there's, there's really very little between them. You could go, you could go, to, a, you could go to, a, to, a, to an Baruch Malachai and to a Baruch Haman. It takes a second. Believe me, I've seen it happen so many times. You know, the famous saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Where people do the wrong thing and they think they're doing the biggest, biggest mitzvah in the world. And, and where people do the right thing and they, and, and they think they're doing the worst thing in the world. And, and th that's, that's what Purim is. So, so that's one of the things that I used to speak about a lot. That, that, that Purim is, is, the hidden, is the hidden miracle and that's why you wear a mask. You wear a mask. When you wear a mask, I don't know who you are. Right? Who you really are is behind the mask. Not, you know, there, there was a um, very interesting thing I spoke about a long time ago on Facebook. So I used to always get up on, and talk about Facebook I don't talk about it anymore, right? Because I became the Facebook rabbi. I don't want to be the Facebook rabbi. You know, I want to be multifaceted. You know, in the, in, in, in the old days, there, was, there were these actors that played like Superman, right? Chris, this guy Reeves, in my day, black and white. This guy played Superman. So he couldn't get another job. He was Superman. So he, he, he tried to be on a movie. He tried to be an actor about something else. It was, ah, Superman. So he couldn't play someone else because didn't, everyone who was watching was like, he's not Superman in this movie. He's, it's a Western. Like, you know, hello? Right? So, so he, he was stuck to one job and he, he, he killed himself, he committed suicide. He jumped off a building and he didn't fly. Right? And it was very, it was very, very sad. It was very sad. Same thing happened with what's her name in The Wizard of Oz. She was cast in The Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland, and after that she couldn't get another job because she was, and she committed suicide. So, George Reeves. George Reeves. So, so you don't want to be, I don't want to be the Facebook rabbi, that's it. You know, he only talked about Facebook. So, but, but it was interesting because my belief in Facebook was that, that, that a person puts on Facebook um, his fantasy. In other words, you had little kids that were 13 year old, they were, they were seventh graders in my, in my school that were getting dressed up like they were 17 year old girls. And then there were guys 
who were poor, I knew they were borrowing money from me, right? They were borrowing money from me just to $20. And then his picture on Facebook, he's in front of this huge mansion and a Bentley behind him. I'm like, no, right? And he's sending out messages to everyone like, I'm 19, I'm in real estate, I have a Bentley, and he has this beautiful picture, and he's wearing a tux and a Bentley and a mansion. I'm like, that ain't his Bentley, and that ain't his mansion. I know this kid, he doesn't have $2 to rub together. So my head was, my head was, that's a very dangerous, Facebook is very dangerous, because it allows a person to be who he's not. You cannot grow. You cannot grow as a person unless you know who you are. It's very, very important. A lot of people live in this fence. You have to know who you are. Because once you get to know who you are, you know your strengths. And you know your weaknesses. If, if you don't have a Bentley and you don't have a mansion, what are, you, what are you doing? You might get one one day, but you're not going to get one this way by taking a picture with it. You're going to get it by working hard. I mean, having a lot of, a lot of siyat, siyat to the shmai with that kudosh baruch. And, but you're not going to get it by taking a picture. That's, that's baloney. And if you take your face and you put it in this body with big muscles... Right? I mean, even though you don't have one muscle, and that's your picture on Facebook. Wow, look at this guy, right? Meanwhile, you meet him, you don't have no muscle. He's a skinny little kid, right? So what are you putting on a muscle shirt? Go, go work out. So I felt that was very bad for people, because if you live in this fantasy, then you don't have to live the real life. You don't live the real life, you don't grow. The fantasy world doesn't grow. It's all fake. It's fake. You, put, you, you turn on the lights, it's gone, right? So, so I was very against that. And that's what I believed. And I believed that it was robbing kids working hard they, they just they made they, you know photoshopping photoshopping that you don't need to go, you don't need to go to the gym you just photoshop some muscles but the truth of the matter is you don't have any muscles well photoshop that you have muscles but you don't really have any muscles so that was my belief what happens there's a huge case and what's this case a court case there's some woman who's a huge professor doctor professor in a huge college and she's on the board of the college she's a big macher and she got drunk one night, and she put on her Facebook, she's standing there with a big bottle of Smirnoff, one of those big jugs of Smirnoff, really, with a sailor hat, backwards, this woman, right? And she's like drinking it, and that's the picture posted on her Facebook. Well, some of the kids in college got a hold of it, and they sent it to the board. And here they have this professor, doctor, board member, with a picture on her Facebook of drinking a bottle a big bottle of vodka with a sailor hat on. So they said, you're fired. You, you represent the college. This is not a representation. It was a, an Ivy League college. This is not a representation of our college. Fired, off the board, no more professor, have a good day, you're fired. She said, I'm fired, we're going to court. So she took it to the, she took it to the Supreme Court of that state. That was a big case because that's her private Facebook. So you can't fire me how I live in my house. I didn't come to school drunk. I didn't come with a sailor hat. You don't have a right to fire me. So they had this huge court case. And of course, it's not a private, it's a public um, place. Facebook is a public place. So it's not a private place. It's not in your house. You made it public. You're embarrassing our college. You're not getting a job back. She sued for a job back plus punitive damages, millions and millions of dollars, whatever it is. So they brought in these psychiatrists. Psychiatrists from all these big Ivy League professors and doctors and all this stuff. And they said something unbelievable, which totally flipped me. So they testified, and this is what they testified. They said that the persona, the person who comes to school, is not really her. That she has to get dressed and she has to go to school. But who she really is, is what she puts on Facebook. She's a drunk with a sailor cap. So that the fantasy is not the Facebook. The person is the Facebook. The fantasy is what the person lives outside. What they post is who they really want to be. If that's who they really want to be, they pass them that's who she is. And this went in front of the Supreme Court. And they went with the college. And they, they, held, they upheld the college and they, 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 she got nothing. That the person who presents themselves on Facebook, that's who they're... Nichnas Yayin... Yeah, it's his side. She was drunk. That's who she is. So they took it to the appellate court. They appealed, she appealed it. She was, this was a very big thing. She appealed it. She lost the appeal. So what, what the person really is, is what, what the person really wants to be, what they represent themselves. So then I said to myself, oh my gosh. If all these kids that are on Facebook, 
and the pictures they're putting up of themselves, if that's who they really are, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. That's what Purim is about. Purim is about going inside yourself and finding out what part of you is Baruch Mordechai and what part of you is Ora Mordechai. What part of you is Baruch Haman and what part is Ora Haman. And that's why you allowed to drink on Purim. Because Chazal knew that you can't get there. You can't get there if you're totally clear. Because you, you won't let yourself get there. You won't see your ugly side. You won't see your dark side. Because we don't want to see that side. But on Purim, you can see that side. Because it's the hidden part of Klai Yisrael that saved us. And, and getting in touch with who you are, and I tell you this all the time, I spend a lot of time before I help people to know exactly who I am. So you can't help anyone else until you help yourself. And that takes time, and that takes sitting quietly by yourself, and that takes beating yourself up a little bit. That's good. Nothing wrong with it. But you don't get, if you're real, you don't get depressed by it. Just the opposite. If I know that my left hand is not as good as my right hand, and that if I'm in a boxing match, I have to lead with my right hand and back it up with my left hand, then I become a good boxer. But if I fool myself, I think I have a great left hand. I, I, I'm going to hit from the blind side. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be laying, the next thing I'll be doing is laying, looking at the sky. So it, you, have to know your, you have to know your weaknesses. That's your strength. If you, if, you, if you don't know your weaknesses and you can't protect yourself, then you're going to, and a lot of people have that problem because they don't know their weaknesses. They get whacked from behind. They don't know what hit them. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking spiritually, emotionally, physically, all the different things. So, so that's Purim. Purim is a time to, to go into the hidden you. Not only the hidden Hashem and all the miracles he does that you can be, that you can see, and all these things that, you know, that are not, don't look like miracles, but the hidden you is very, very important. So that was always my theme. But I, I bought a sefer, a beautiful sefer called Eitzah HaMedrashim, which means all the Medrashim. And I see that the Medrash has a very different theme. Totally, I've never heard anyone connect Purim to this theme. So I'm going to tell you what the theme is. Amar Rabbi Pinchas. Oy dava toiv hayyubay. The Medrash said there were four good things about Achashverosh. He says, Rabbi Pinchas, there's a fifth good thing about Achashverosh. What is it? Anyone who did him a favor, anyone who did something good for Achashverosh, he wrote it down. Not only the good that the person did for him, Elagam is me Asa. Who did it for him? In order to be makatayv, to appreciate what the person did. So the Medrash says like this, boys. And I will show it to you, Mitzvah Hashem, tonight, throughout the whole Medrash. That, the, that Megillah's Esther and the miracle of Purim is all about Hakaras Hatayv. Showing appreciation. And the re and uh, uh, he says like this surely a guy, surely an Achashverosh, who was a Russia, wasn't a good guy, he was a Russia, he was a murderer. He mamish murdered his wife because she didn't come to a dance. A murderer, a Russia, a low life. But one thing he had anyone did him a favor, he took out his book and he wrote it down. When the favor was done, who did the favor, and what the favor was. And because of that Hakoras HaToy that Achashverosh had, Klai Yisrael was saved because that night when he couldn't sleep, he saw the whole miracle, he saw what, what Mordechai did for him, and he didn't pay back Mordechai, and, he, and the whole Haman, and that was Perik Vav, that was the beginning of the Geula. So we see, says the Medrash, that the whole Geula came from Hakoras HaToy that Achashverosh had. And in the end, Achashverosh, Right, had, got, he, she got pregnant, Esther, and had Darius, and Darius built the base of Middash. Not Stam Achishverosh, what he, what he became from him. He had a child, a Jewish child. So, why? Because he had one Midah, guys. He had appreciation. He had a curse at Why was Haman destroyed? Why was Haman destroyed? Because Haman was the opposite. Haman was a kafwe tov. He didn't appreciate, just the opposite. He didn't appreciate anything. How do you know Haman was a kafwe tov? 
Because when the Megillah introduces Haman, right? What does it call him? It's unbelievable. And his mom just blew me away We're preparing this year, the last week. And that the whole basis, Megillah as Esther, is that Kor Satov. I would never see that. It's like Mamash is secret. But if you look in the Psukim, right, it says the following. It's amazing. He says like this Who's Haman? Who is Haman? made him big as Haman ben Hamdasa Agagi. Who was Agagi? Was Amalek? Was Agag? Right? Well, who was Agag? Who was Agag? Agag was the king of Amalek when Shmuel told Shaul to wipe out Amalek. What happened? Shaul made a big mistake, and he said the Hashem said destroy the people and the animals. Shaul said, Shaul made a little cheshbon, which is a different share. Right? Don't make cheshbon. When God tells you to do something, don't make cheshbon. Do what he tells you to do. He knows what he's talking about. Hashem said, kill the women, kill the children, kill the men of Amalek, and kill all their animals. Came along Shaul, he said, okay, men, women, children, we have to wipe them out. But instead of killing animals, that's just a waste. Let's take all their animals and bring them up as a carbon. That's nice and from. Right? Isn't that a good idea? We should just kill the animals, slaughter them, and let them die? Give them to the lions? Let's bring them up as carbonites. It's not what Hashem told them to do. It's not what Hashem told them to do. But he went ahead and he did it. So what happened, everybody? So why is the, the beginning of the Megillah screaming to us that he was Ben Agag? First of all, he wasn't the son of Agag. That was really his great, great, great grandfather. But he's telling, him, he's telling us, it's skipping everybody, he's telling us he was the son of Agag. He wasn't the son of Agag, according to one measure, but... He was great, great grandchild of Agog, who came from Amalek, who came from Eliphaz, who came from Amalek. So why are you telling me Ben Agog? He wasn't Ben Agog, he was great, great grandson. The answer is because Haman's. Oh, I think I might have done something to this. I don't know what's talking to me. I think I hit it and it jumped. Or oh, somebody's calling. I'm not sure. No, I think I hit it and it turned off. Just turn it back, just call it again. Okay. So anyway, so. Why is it called Agog? Because who saved who saved who saved Agog? Shaul. What shaver did Shaul come from? Binyamin. Binyamin. Right? If it wasn't for Shaul having pity on the animals, Agog would have what happened was Agog and his wife turned themselves into animals. They were they were sorcerers. They turned themselves into animals. She got pregnant that night, they escaped. She got pregnant the night before they brought the animals as Karbanas, and they had they ran away, they had a baby, and from that baby came Haman. Came that whole that's why Amalek is still around. So how much should so, and now where was Mordechai from? Was Mordechai? What shave it? Binyamin. From Binyamin. So how could you Binyamin was right? Shaul was from Binyamin. Shaul, if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't even be in this world, Haman. You would have killed that gog, your, your great grandfather, you would have been dead. So how could you kill? How could you kill someone from Shaven Binyamin when it was Shaul from Shaven Binyamin that saved you? So the so the, the Megillus Esther is telling us right away, Haman. Why did Haman die? And Achishverus live because Haman was a kafri tov. Haman should have said, "Listen, Mordechai is from Mordechai doesn't have to bow down to me. He's from Binyamin. Binyamin saved my grandfather. It wasn't for Binyamin. It wasn't Shaul from Binyamin. I wouldn't be here today. So you know what? Leave him alone. Karsa tov." It was a kafri toiv. So Haman had to hang. And Achishverosh, who had karsa toiv, ended up having a child that was Darius, which ended up a Jewish child, which ended up building the base on Megdash. So that's why the Megillah starts off with, you need to know where Haman came from. Haman came from Ag- Agog. Who saved Agog? Shol. Where did Shol come from? Binyamin. Where did Mordechai come from? Binyamin. At least let, at least let Mordechai live. He let your grandfather live, Right? No, and they were direct descendants, Esther, and and uh, and what's it called? And that's why, that's why later on, beautiful, it's beautiful midrash. That's why later on, it's a different taich. When 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 um, when what's it called? When when Mordechai said to Esther in Hacharish Tacharishi, if you're not going to go and save Kol Yisrael, right? Ubeisavich Tavedu. Your, 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 the family, the, the, your, your father's family will be lost. What does that mean, my father's family will be lost? Because she was a direct descendant of Shaul. Shaul messed up, destroying Amalek. He let the animals live, right? 
So here, if you're not going to save Klai Yisrael, and you're not going to destroy Haman, you're not going to fix, same Gilgal, same story that we just said about, about Moshe Menu. you're not going to fix what Shaul did. You have a chance now to fix what Shaul did. You have a chance to destroy Haman and all his kids. If you're not going to do it, then your whole father's house is lost. Because the whole reason Haman's being destroyed is because he was a Kafri Taif. Because he didn't show appreciation. Who did he show appreciation to? Shaul, who saved him. So you, you have the power, because he's a Kafri Taif, to take him down. Because you come from Shaul. And you saved Haman's family. Shaul saved Haman's family. You saved Haman's family. So if you're not going to do it, it's going to do it. She, you're, knew. You're, she knew she was from Shaul. He was, te- he was also Mordechai from from Binyam. He was telling her, you have to do it because we are the ones that he's a coffee type to. He wasn't a coffee type to everyone else. They didn't try to save him. But Shoal saved him. So if, if he wants to kill you, and that's what she said to the king, he wants to kill me, my family, and the whole Klai Yisrael. How could he want to kill me and my family? I am from Binyamin. I am from Shoal. Shoal saved this guy. He has no, he has no accursed type. So she was the one that could take him down because she came from Shoal. And, that, and that's the basis, and I'm going to read inside a little bit. That's the basis of the whole Megillah's Esther. Hakarais Hatoyev. Was that and, Megar at some point? No. So how did he have a... She was Jewish, Esther. Came from Esther. Yeah, but how did... It, didn't come from, it doesn't matter what he was. He was a guy. She, she became pregnant from him. In fact, um, the Medjus... How did that work out? That she, that she actually got pregnant from no, him? No, that, that she allowed herself to... So the Gemara talks about it. The Gemara says she was either kaka oilam, there's a whole, there's many different, many different things, but it does say that she, she lost everything. She was also to, to Mordechai after that. Okay. She gave up, she gave up everything. Wasn't you she don't forced? Even, what? She was forced to, to marry you. But it doesn't matter. You also labayl, also labayl. Because it was a guy. But anyway, but it's a machoik. But Lamai said she gave up, she gave up everything. I, I'm not up to that half of the medrash. Um, I, I hope to put that share out but she, she um, what happened was like this, the Medrash says that, I do have that part the Medrash says that, that every time that, and the Gemara brings this down, that every time she went into him to sleep with him she, she made a, sh- a shin, she used the shin dalad. she didn't go in the same thing that Sari made her used by Paro and, the, and, the, and but what happened was, he said very, it's very interesting, it's very deep, I mean I, I, I can't cover nearly what I want to cover tonight, but, but it's very interesting because what happened was when he sent her in this time, right, to the king the last time, and she said, I might get killed because he didn't put, I don't know if he wants me there, right? He sent her in, and, and he under, she understood, she, she, did, she was saying to him, it's bad enough, like you're asking this question, it's bad enough I have to sleep with him when, when I'm supposed to. You want me to go in and volunteer? That was her taina to Mordechai. Her taina to Mordechai was, that's one thing if he calls me Malkarcha. This was the big problem. When he forced her to come in, right? So she talked not us her to her, to her husband, to, to, to Mordechai. But now Mordechai was saying, go in. He didn't call you. So you're going in on your own. Now if you're going on your own, then you weren't forced. If you're not forced, it means you're giving, you can never be your usher to, the, to, the, your usher to me to come back to the husband, right? If a woman commits adultery... She's married to someone. She commits adultery, right? She's also a boil to the guy who did the adultery, and she's also to go back to her bow. If she's raped, unless he's a client, the husband, she can go back. If a, if a woman's married, she goes out and some guy rapes her, right? She can go back to her husband, unless she's an Asian client. If she's an Asian client, she can't go back to her husband. That's why a client has to be very careful with his wife. It's good sense. He has to be very careful with his wife, because God forbid, so I know of a story that happened on the West Side many, many years ago where a client's wife got raped, and he had to divorce her. So you have to watch your wife. And you have to watch your wife anyway, whether you're kind or not. But, but so, so she claimed over here, she said to him, to Mordechai, I don't want to go. I don't want to go because now you're telling me if I go, I mean, I don't want to be with Achishverosh my whole life. Right? If I go, and I go willingly, then I'm usher to you because they were married. So I'm usher to you. So if you look at the Pasuk, it says, look at the words. Okay, here. So 
she says to him, uh, Don't worry about your soul. So, so the Medrash says, what do you mean, don't worry about your soul? Don't worry about yourself. What's nafshech? Right? So the Teretz is, and the Medrash says this, and it's brought down other Mepharshim, that she said, until now I didn't do an Avera. Because until now, any time I had to sleep with him, I was forced. So I was on Anusa. It was like being raped. But now, you tell me to go willingly. That's an Avera. So she said to him, I don't have a right to do an Avera to go willingly. So he said, no, this is not the time to worry about your soul, to worry about doing an Avera. Al Tadmi bin Right? Now, he says like this, the Medrash. The Medrash says that every single time she went, she didn't go. She created, she had this Shin Dalit. Now a Shin Dalit can change their, their looks to look exactly like anybody except for their feet. Their feet are webbed. Except for their feet, they can't change. So she would send, and this, the Medrash says it's more than many times, she would have this Shin Dalit and she would go sleep with Achashverosh. Achashverosh did not know the difference. She created a Shindalit? Well, the Shindalit is created, but she, caught, she no, made, she it, made it, it go. She uses it for her benefit. Isn't that very bad for her? No. That's the story with the keys. That wasn't, that's not here. It's not bad for her. Uh, uh, what's it called? That was also the connection. It says that, 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 that she became queen of 127 countries in the schutz of Sarah that lived 127 years. What does one have to do with the other? Right? The terrorist is that Sarah also did the same thing by Paro when she was in the house of Paro, so she also did the same thing here. But, this is very interesting, this time, he said to her, do not use the Shin Dalad. Because if you use the Shin Dalad this time, two things. Number one, the Shin Dalad might become pregnant, right? Number two, the, no, it, we know that from the, from the Kabayosha, we learned that whole story with the, with the, with the Mayo. But besides that, the biggest problem is that the Yeshua of Kala Yisrael will come from the dark side. In other words, if she's going to go in there and then she, the whole thing with Haman, the whole story is going to happen, it's going to come from the dark side. It's going to come from the dark side. The Yeshua is going to come from the dark side. That's not worth anything. So he said to her, so he, so he, she said to him, she said, I, I'm worried about my nefesh. So he said to her, don't worry about your nefesh, right? Because if you're not going to, if you're going to withhold what do you mean? How could you withhold? She's going to send the Shindalad in. Revach v'hatzala, the Revach and Hatsala, Yamoy by Yehudim will come to the Jews mimakam acher. Now, acher is the expression of the other side. It's called the Sitra acher. Many, many, many times, it's not called Yetzahara or the Satan, it's called the Sitra acher, the other Sitra. So he said to her, if you're not going to go, it's going to come from the dark side. If it comes from the dark side, then everything's going to be lost. The whole Jewish nation is going to be lost. You, your family, everyone's going to be lost. So therefore, he says to her, This is the reason you became the queen. Until now, you could have gotten away with it. Keep sending her in. Keep sending her in. It's not the pregnancy thing that was the problem. Keep sending her in. It's no problem because she's going to get pregnant in the other times. Keep sending her in. He says, but now the Revach is coming. I, I, he, he thought, and that Saul is coming. It's going to come from the dark side. We're all lost. So it must be the you're here for this time. And she talked and went. She went to the Melech on her own, on her own will. And because of that, she was also to, 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 to Mordechai. She gave up everything, like Rachel Imenu. Mamash, like Rachel Imenu. She gave up everything. The, the miracle is really based on a woman. It's really, that's why it's called Megillas Esther, not Megillas Mordechai. It's really based on a woman because Lemaisa, in the end of the day, she's the, one who did the, she's the one who did the action to sacrifice her life to save Klai Yisrael. He was, he was the coach and he was the, the shayfet and he was everything else. But at the end of the day, she lost everything. She had to live in the, in the, in the, in the palace of Moshe Rabbeinu, in the palace of Agai, in the palace of Tumma. She lost everything. She was Esther to, to Mordechai. She mamash lost everything. And, and that's why it's called Megillah Esther. And that's why it's called Tanis Esther. And that's why this whole holiday is around a woman. It's called, it's called Esther. Just like Rus. 
Women have a very big koyach. They have a very, very big koyach. And over here we see that she, 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 she was scared about her nefesh. She, she said, well, how can I go willingly? I'm going willingly to an Aveira. He says, when it comes to Klai Yisrael, yeah, you have to go. You have to do it. Now is not a time to worry about to worry about your soul. It's like it's like the same thing. I always speak to Rabbi Gamliel. I don't get that much time to learn. I prepare for Shira, but I don't get that much time to learn myself. So he says, "What is um, when a person gives over right his nefesh? What does that mean, right? The kuach nefesh. Um, what, what, what does it what does it mean when a person? What's the word? Mesiras nefesh. What does it mean, mesiras nefesh? Did you give all your money? No. Did you give all your time? No. Mesiras nefesh means you're losing from your neshama to help others. In other words, I could be learning now. And someone's coming and I'm helping them, right? He says, that's the greatest thing. Don't worry about it. It's mysterious. Now, she said, over here, well, my neshama, I'm a tznua. She was such a tznua. Now, according to the Medjish, when she married, this machlek is how old she was, 75, 80, or I believe 65. How old she was when she married, they have different proofs. How old she was when she married um, Ahasuerus. It says that for 75 years, she never left her house. She was such a tznua. Do you know what it means for a person who's such a tznua? She never left her house. She never looked at a man's face for 75 years. And then you put her, it was the lowest guy he slept with, all those girls that came to him, right? I don't know how many years, three years, four years, right? He slept with every one of them. They were all in his harem. A low life, a real, real low life. And you take this cudgish thicker girl, she's that girl, 75-year-old woman, never looked at a man's face, cudgish kadashim, and you put her into this position and she goes into this position and she goes willingly to the king knowing that if she goes in there and he puts her shabbats off what's going to happen and she sacrifices everything for Kala Yisrael wow it's crazy it's crazy and that sacrifice that Nachshem Ben Aminadav that jumping into the Amsaf saved Kala Yisrael it wasn't for her it was, there was no saving Kala Yisrael very ridiculous. It's a very ridiculous story. Anyway, so, so it starts with Hakar Satoyev. That Achishverosh had Hakar Satoyev. How surely, surely, we as Jews, that was Achishverosh, the low life, he had Hakar Satoyev. Everything we did. How many of us write down when someone does something good? How many of us have such a book? I would scare to say that no one in this room, including me, has such a book. But every day, someone who does me good, lends me money, says good morning, is there for me, whatever it is. My parents, I write in my book today, my tati paid my credit card. Today, my father did this. Today, my mother did this. Today, my friend did this. Today, my teacher helped me with this. There is no such a book. We don't have such a book. Achashverosh did. Achashverosh had such a book. Anyone who did him good, he had them write it in the book. Maybe they, it's unbelievable. I never thought of it. And it wasn't for that. There's no Mordechai. There's no saving his life. There's, the whole thing doesn't happen. Mamish unbelievable. And Haman was the opposite. This guy saved you. Binyamin saved you. Shaul saved you, and you're killing the same guy that saved you? Without them, you wouldn't be alive? Even if you kill all the Jews, but them? They kept you alive? He went down the drain. Unbelievable. Anyway, I want to tell you a crazy story that I heard this week. Oh, it's so, so late. Anyway, story, like, unbelievable story. And it's true, I heard it from Rabbi Fisher. My Rav in, uh, on East 20, 22nd Street on Avenue Y. My Rav in Shul. He came up to me and said, well, I, have, I, have to you such a, I have to tell you a story. It's a crazy story. I know that it's true. And it's a crazy story. I know the guy that it happened to. It's a true story. So there was this, this person who lives in the five towns. And um, he lives by the water. And he was so very proud. About six months ago, he burnt his mortgage. Burning your mortgage means when you pay your mortgage in your house, so the bank sends it paid to you. And you, it's called a burning mortgage. You take the mortgage and you, you put it in the fireplace, whatever it is, and you burn the mortgage, and it's like a very happy day. You have, your house is free of a mortgage. It's a, it's a big simcha. So he made a little party for some of his family. He's burning the mortgage. Fine. The next uh, the guy who lived a few, the, was also invited, like the block, the guys who know him, the were his friends. It's a big thing. It was only $250,000 mortgage. It's not, it wasn't a million dollar mortgage, but for him it was a very big thing. He burns the mortgage. Fine. A month later, friend out two houses down or down the block comes to him and says I went into this investment and it's going really really good but to, to hold the whole investment I have to come up with another $250,000 or I'm going to lose the whole investment but it's a very good investment then so I, I was by your mortgage Bernie could you take a, a, a home equity loan for $250,000 
and lend it to me. I know that you don't have any mortgage on your house. I'm sure you could get a home equity loan. Now, you have to understand something. I'm, I'm already in this age, right? When you burn a mortgage, it's like you don't want that problem on your head no more. The 250 are gone. It's like whew, not to have a mortgage on your house is a very big thing, right? So he's like, uh, he's like, I really, really need it. So he went to his wife, right? And his wife said to him, did you look at the investment? How do we know he's going to pay us back? Go to the Rav. Go to the Rav. The Rav knows this other guy very well. Go to the Rav. Ask him if you should lend him the money. So they go to the Rav. The Rav's a smart man. He says he wants to see the investment that the guy's in, right, whatever it is. He knows him for a very long time. He's a very honest guy. So after checking everything out, the Rav calls these, this couple in. He says, listen, it's a very big mitzvah to lend Jewish people money without interest. It's a very, very big mitzvah. I think um, it would be a good idea that you should, you know, it's a big mitzvah, you should lend them. I, I, I trust, I, you trust them, I trust them. I think that he'll pay you back. Okay, that's what the Rav said. It's, it's a crazy mitzvah because I, I understand it. You finished, it's off, it's over, and then this guy shows up and you have to take another $250,000 out. It's like you're waiting 20, 30 years to do this. And like a month later, a guy shows up, he needs $250,000. I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. But they did it. So they go to the bank, and they're like, we want to get a home equity loan. Home equity loan is a little easier than a mortgage, $250,000. So they look at all the papers, and they're like, this is a true story. And they're like, well, we don't loan any more money the way we used to. All your papers that you have from your mortgage, you, ha you have to have flood insurance. If you don't have flood insurance in this area, we will not lend you a dollar. And you don't have flood insurance. Because in the other mortgage, they didn't need it. 30 years ago, you didn't need flood insurance. So, how much is the flood insurance? So they went to the broker, whatever it was. So they went to the rub, and the rub said, it's not, it's not, it's not interest, right? It's flood insurance. He, if you're taking out flood insurance in order to get the loan, so it's part of the loan, whatever, whatever. You pay. So the guy said, okay, $2,000 a year, whatever it is, I'll pay the flood insurance. I'll pay your flood insurance. It's not that. So... In order to get the loan, so I don't know exactly how they wired it. That it's not that it's not it's not my not my problem how they wired it. Whatever it is, so he gets flood insurance, and he gets the loan two months before the hurricane. He gets the loan and he lends the guy the money, and his house during the hurricane Sandy gets wiped out. Had he not lent this guy the money, he would have had no flood insurance. So forget about that he had no mortgage, he would have had no house. To replace that house would have cost him $800,000. So he would have had no mortgage and no house. Now, he lent the guy the $250,000, guy put it in his business, and his house is being rebuilt because he's, he's got insurance. Kosh Baruch works. So it looked like to him, God, just pay my mortgage. Leave me alone. This guy shouldn't send this guy over to me for two. I just got, just got, we're just partying. We're going to Florida. We're so happy. Hashem, it's not fair. Now you send the guy right away. I got to go to the room. I got to ask coaches. I got to ask shoes. Oh my God, I have to go through this whole thing. Meanwhile, Hashem's like, if you lend him the money, you're going to save your house. $800,000 you're going to save. If you don't lend him the money, you're going to have nothing. You're going to have no mortgage. You're going to have no house. You'll be $600,000 in the hole or whatever it is. So this guy, not knowing, just by doing it, by doing Mister, man, the whole world, life is Mister. Sometimes you get to see it, but most of the time you don't get to see it. And he not lent them the money. Bye bye, bye bye house. You have to replace his house. It would have cost him eight hundred thousand dollars. Now, very excited about that he lent the money, but when it happened, they were like, Ah, oh, come on, Hashem, little horror, You know, come on, I know it's a big mitzvah, but we just got free. We just, you know, we just burnt it. Now I got to worry. He's not going to pay me. He's going to pay me. So that, that's really what, what we have to celebrate. Lemaise, we have to celebrate the Nister. There's so much Nister. And that's why, that's why um, we have these four mitzvahs. Because the four mitzvahs that you have on Purim is Shlachmanos, right? Which is our Karsa Tov to your friends or the friends that you have. Because we know the Gemara says if you have no friend, you have no life. Right? Ichavusa imi susa. Give me a friend or give me death. Right? If you, so you have friends, and they're there for you, and, they're, and, they're, and you're not lonely. So you have a cross of type for your friends. What's your cross of type 
for your friends, Shlach Monos, Yishle Reyehu. You have Hakar Satev Tarkosh Baruch Hu. And what's Hakar Satev Tarkosh Baruch Hu? The reading of the Megillah, Pasu Me Nisa. Tarkosh Baruch Hu, thank you, Hakar Baruch Hu. Everybody needs to know that Hakar Baruch Hu saved us. You have Hakar Satev to your family. What's Hakar Satev to have your family? The Sudas Purim. Invite your family. You have Hakar Satev to your family. And finally, the biggest nister, you have Hakar Satev to the poor people. Why? Why were poor people? Why were poor people created so that you would have a chance to do the mitzvah of giving tzedakah? So you have matanos levyanim is your appreciation is your karsatayv to the poor people, karsatayv to your family, karsatayv to the to the, to, uh, to your friends, and karsatayv to Hakadosh Baruch Of course, not in that order. First Hakadosh Baruch First, the first karsatayv. What do you have? What do you do? The first thing on Purim. What's the first mitzvah? Megillah. The karsatayv to Hakadosh Baruch and then you have the rest. Then you have that during the day you could do those three. I mean, the last thing is really, which is interesting, which I find very interesting, but it's very true. So, what's the last bit of the day? Shudas Purim. So, across the type to your family. In between, it's across the type to your to Avyanim, to poor people, and across the type to your friends. Really, the hardest across the type there is is to your family. It really is. Giving across the type to Hashem, God. I could see, I could hear, I could, I could do all these things, I, I made a good deal, thank you Hashem. You know, we don't give him Hakar Satoyf for everything, but of I understand that Hakar Satoyf. Hakar Satoyf to your friends, oh yeah, number one. You know, number one, you don't mess with somebody's friends. I know that with girls, I teach teenage girls, I tell the parents, the one thing you don't mess with, well, I'll tell her she has to break up from this friend, I'm like, if I tell her that, she will never talk to me again. If I tell her, don't ever talk to your parents again, she'll talk to me. No problem. <laughs> If I tell her anything, but if I tell her you can't talk to these friends, you don't mess with kids' friends. You don't mess with anybody's friends. Because it's, it's like a different... And many times our parents are like, I don't understand, you love your friends. For your friends, you get up in the middle of the night, I call you, you're like, eh, call Chaim. You know? Yeah, your friend, you jump. We are a little jealous. We are a little jealous of our kids' friends. Yes, they do get more attention than we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, the friends, but the su'uda, which is the last thing, when the family says, family, family is taken, uh, uh, taken for granted. Anytime I come into a school and I say, so what do you guys do for chesed? Oh, we have chesed projects. I'm like, so what do you do? We go to nursing homes. What do you do? I take care of a kid with cancer. What do you do? A Down syndrome. What do you do? Autistic. I've, I don't think I've ever heard, maybe, maybe in the 30 years I'm doing this, 35 years I heard this, maybe two kids said, uh, I, I go visit my grandmother. Because in our heads, Chesed has nothing to do with family. We'll do chesed for anyone but our family. You will have people, kids that will do people that will do anything for any guy in this room, but for his mother and father, he won't do anything. Call my brother, call my cousin, call my this. He won't do anything. Why? Because the, the ones that we take for granted more than anybody else, not our friends, not poor people, not Hashem, is our family. So the end of Purim, the end of Purim, you're sitting around with your family. And the, ba- the, the, the basis of Yiddishkeit, the basis of Yiddishkeit is Mishpacha. That's who we are. We are a family. It's Mishpacha. So the last part of Purim, the last part of Purim is Mishpacha. Suda. is a Suda. But all four of them are all across the type. And, and, and I don't have time tonight in Mitzvah Hashem. I really, I wish I would have been here last week. There's so much, I have so much unbelievable Midrashim to say. But in Mitzvah Hashem, I, I don't think I'll be here next week. Probably Rabbi Lamb will give the shear, but I will give the shear somewhere, and I will have to any time tape it and and call Lush and tape it in Mitzvah Hashem, and you'll be able to. Or maybe what I'll do is I'll just do it in my house tomorrow or two days later, and then I'll put I'll, I'll put up the other shear. So if you want to get it, because there's there there is there is so so much more. So I want to end with one medrash, and then I'll let you guys go. Here that says um, okay, well that's about Achishverish. I want I want to talk to you about Shabbos for a minute. It's it's unbelievable. The whole thing of Vashti, and you know I told, I spoke about this years ago. Oh here, yeah, okay. The re- the reason that Hashem became 
so angry here at us is that this whole thing that they did they, they set us up in, in a kosher in a kosher the wine was kosher everything was kosher so we didn't think that there was any wrong with it and, and we ended up doing it we weren't they were very careful Achishverosh and Haman were very careful not to force us because if you look, if you look, it says Hashtia Kadas Ein Oines. The drinking was open Ein Oines. Nobody was forced. He came. He sat Hamelach Al Kol Rab Beis Alatzus Kitzayin Ish Ve'Ish. He gave specific instructions to to all his people. Achashverosh, not to force the Jews. Let them do Kitzayin Ish Ve'Ish. Let them do what they want to do. So he says, Shalai Chrisam. He didn't force them. Whoever wanted to drink wine, they had kosher wine, right? Like all these, these, these kosher clubs and these kosher gatherings that they have on Facebook that they advertise, the Purim Spiel and all this other stuff. It's fake. It's, it's the Satan. It's, it's the whole thing is, is to make it kosher, is to get you there. So he says the following. How come Haman didn't force all the Jews to come to the party? He should have made them come to the party. The God of these Jews, He hates sexual things. Put up prostitutes. Make them a party. Right? And, and just say they can come if they want to. They can do whatever they want. Whoever wants to come should come. If you don't want to come, don't come. We're not forcing you. So they shouldn't be able to answer. They forced us to come here. So, so the, the king actually said, that's a very good idea. Don't force them. That way Hashem will say, they went on their own. They have no excuse. When Mordechai saw this, he yelled at them, don't go eat from the Sudan. They only said, they only invited you to this, to this uh, party in order to prosecute you. So that they can bring the Midas Adin of Akash Baruch to Makatrik on you. And they didn't listen to Mordechai and they went to the, they went to the Beis HaMishnah. And I want to read you, here, listen to this. Bayom Hashvi in the seventh day, which was Shabbos, Kitoy Vlev Hamelach Bayayin when the king was drunk. Amal the Muhuman, there's a machloek as who Muhuman was, right? This is a chavayin of Bixa. Muhuman is either Daniel or or Haman. Vavaksa, right? And he lahavi is Vashti Amalkus. He asked the question, why Bayom Hashvi, right? So he says, first of all, he says something negative. Listen to this about the Jewish women. What happened by Achashverosh is he took out all the Kalim from the base Hamikdash, and that's how he served everybody. So the Jewish people didn't. We didn't walk out. We allowed. We ate and drank from the Kalim of the base Hamikdash, which you're not allowed to. But he says, Kivin when the women saw, because she made Vashti made a party for the women. When the Jew, Jewish women saw Shalayim Mishtamshim B'Chleim Meis Hamikdash, when they saw the Kalim of the base Hamikdash, Loi Ratzel Lechli Mahem, they didn't. They would not eat there. They would not eat with Achashverosh with the, with the Kalim. The women said, absolutely not. The biggest sin of everything that was done was Chilol Shabbos. So because Baruch Hu made, because he was so busy with Vashti that day that he didn't force Kala Yisrael to be Mechal Shabbos. But anyway, we know that... Um, we know that the reason she was killed and she was not dressed when she, she couldn't come down not dressed and she grew a tail, whatever happened, um, was because she made Klai, the, daughter, the, the girls of Klai Yisrael would have to work for her on Shabbos undressed. So he says, Because she made the Jewish girls, this is a Gemara, I believe, a Gemara? No, it's not a Gemara. But it says the following, it's a famous story. Since Vashti made the Jewish girls be Machal Shabbos, by the way, 127 Shabbosim in a row, she made them be Machal. And that's why, and she was the queen of 127 countries. 
and that's why she was takahong. This gavla b'rosa shu of chenina ben ben tarsa. The famous story with the cow of chenina ben tarsa. It's brought down the story. So he went to lots of malachah b'shabes. It's a whole story. This guy sold this other person a cow, and the cow would not work on Shabbos, and he want, he said it's a mekach tos. It wouldn't work on Saturday. I think he sold it to a guy. And then, anyway, to make a long story short, they found out why. Because in the cow was the Gilgo of, of, of what's her name, of Ashti. So her punishment was that she came back as a cow and, and she could not work on Shabbos. Could you imagine? That was a guy that was making other people Mechal Shabbos. I think if the kids today understood that texting and all this stuff on Shabbos, that being Mechal Shabbos, you come back as a cow, right? And that was a guy. It was a guy. We have to think twice about being Mechal Shabbos. Shabbos is, Shabbos is Kodesh Kedoshim, Kodesh Kedoshim Shabbos. And, and, and it's for some reason the Yitzhahara is doing whatever he can to, that, that Klai Shol today, our young children, that that's the one thing that, that, that they're after. Okay, so to wrap it up, to wrap it up, Lemaisa, 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 the, the, the godless of this Megillah, and we'll have to learn further into it, is that Achashverosh, who had Akaras HaToiv, teaches us that everything he wrote down, everything that someone did good for him, maybe it's a minute that we should start doing it every night before we go to sleep. Write down, I did something good to you. you you'll have a book of unbelievable things. And later on in life, if you, if you have the ability to help them, you know, to go back and help them. Look at him. He couldn't sleep. The first thing he says is, and it's an interesting thing. I, I, I don't remember what it said. Me the connected me. Why couldn't he sleep? Okay, there's many reasons why he couldn't sleep. But why did he think it's because he, did, he didn't remember that someone did something good for him? He felt like this, and I'll, I'll end with this pshat. It's a beautiful pshat. So, so, Lamaisa, what's the connection? They, you can't sleep at night. Is that what you're going to ask? You're going to say, get me wine, sing me a song, put me on a Rabbi Wallerstein tape, right? Get me drowsy. You're not going to tell somebody, if you can't sleep at night, do me a favor and open me my diary. I want to see who I didn't repay. What was in Achishverosh's mind? What was he looking for? He says like this. Now you think how Achishverosh was. Achishverosh said like this. Something's brewing here. Haman, he was very suspicious that Haman was going to try to kill him. Now comes along Esther, who's his queen, right? And she's now inviting him to a party. It, it was never done in the Persian Empire, that you, you can imagine you're the queen and you, and you say to the king, by the way, I want you to come to a party, but bring Harry with you. You know, bring, bring, bring the butler with, with you. Bring some strange guy. Hey, man, you're inviting me to a private party? What's with Haman? So it, was, it wasn't stupid what she did. It put in his mind suspicions that Haman and Esther were planning together to get rid of him. So he couldn't sleep. Why couldn't he sleep? This is how Akashvera thought. It's all based on our curse of time. Akhshvera said like this, if there's such a plan, right, there was a plan once before to kill me, right? If there's such a plan for them to kill me, how come, this is again Persian Empire, how come nobody's telling me? I have, I have, I have my ears, I got ears all over my castle. If Haman and Esther are planning to kill me, how come no one's telling me? So he said, you know why? Because probably someone did something good for me. This is what he said. Someone did something good for me, and I didn't pay them back. So the people in my castle, this is an unbelievable thing by if you're a boss, if you're a boss in a job. What a crazy lesson if you're a boss in a job or you're a principal of a school. Listen carefully to what he said. He said like this. If they're planning to kill me, there's someone in my castle that knows. Why isn't he telling me? There can be the only one reason. Because he has nothing to gain. Now, why would he think that he has nothing to gain? Because probably somebody did me a favor and I didn't pay him back. So this guy thinking, what am I going to put my nose, get involved with an assassination? The king, he's an ungrateful guy. He doesn't pay back. He's not going to give me anything. The other side, if I shut up, maybe they'll pay me off. So Ahasuerus said, Bring me my book. Is there anyone in my book that did me a favor that I didn't pay back? And that's why no one's coming forward to tell me. So when it came in the book, and where does it open up? It opens up, boys, to the last assassination attempt. 
right? The last assassin was somebody did want to kill him. And, and somebody stood up and he put his life on the line and he told me. What did I do for him? He asked the guy that was reading, Haman's son. What did I do for him? And he said, nothing. That's why nobody told me. Immediately, what's the rush? Do it in two weeks, do it in four weeks, pay him back. What, what? Tomorrow morning, he couldn't sleep. Tomorrow morning, I got to pay him back. What are you such a rush? Okay, he saved your life. You waited this long, these many years. So in three months, we'll make a big party and we'll save him. No, I can't sleep tomorrow morning. Why? Because he knew that the minute he pays back Mordechai, he's going to parade him through all the streets. He's going to be wearing the crown. He's going to be, ah. Oh. So now all the guys that are in the castle that might know about the assassination attempt, they're going to say, wow, look what he did for Mordechai. If I save him, he's going to do the same thing for me. So I'm giving an incentive to everybody to tell me what's going on. And that's why it was all based on Akara Satoy. And Akashverosh said, if I don't have Akara Satoy, my people are not going to be there for me. If I'm not there for my people, they won't be there for me. What a lesson! If you're, if you're a boss and someone's trying to steal from you, and someone comes to you and says, hey, um, this guy, this clerk, this guy, in the, he's stealing from you. And you're like, thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And you fire the guy, and you don't do anything for that person. The next person that's going to see that, or if that person sees something, why should I tell him? What do I need to get myself mixed in for? He doesn't appreciate it anyway. Why should I tell him? So if someone does something in your job, or a teacher tells you something, or helps you with something, or you know the principal, and he steps out, and, and, and he does something for you, and, and you don't show appreciation, next time, I don't want to be involved. I'm not interested. If this person doesn't have a curse, I'll tell you, I'm not interested. And all of a sudden, nobody's talking to you in your business, and nobody's talking to the principal, because they're not getting anything back from that person. That's what Achishverosh did here. Achishverosh said, tomorrow morning, I need to reward this person, because I reward this person, I'm going to find out what's going on between Esther and Haman. It's based on Hakaras Hataev, the whole Megillus Esther, the saving of Klai Yisrael in Megillus Esther, and the destruction of Haman is based on Hakaras Hataev, and therefore we have four mitzvahs, four mitzvahs on Purim that are connected to Hakaras Hataev. And therefore, there is a reason to say Baruch Haman. Because on a holiday that's based on appreciation, at the end of the day, because of Haman, Klai Yisrael did tshuva, and with Mekabal Omal Cheshemayim and Mekabal Torah Shabbat Peh Ba'ava. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to destroy us. But at the end of the day, if it wasn't for Haman, at that point, when Haman intervened, we were an Am, before and before, we were spread out, Asher Eloi Das, we were assimilating, we weren't close to Akash Baruch Hu. When he came to Akash we were a big mess. The end, because of him, we became, became poor and became one nation. Am Echad, we became one nation. So even though he's a miserable guy who wanted to destroy us, but if it's a yantiv of Akar Satoiv, then there's a little Baruch Haman. And you got to give him a little Baruch Haman. And the Aura Marachai, because at the end of the day, right, what was the Aura Marachai? I forgot what the Aura Marachai because Mordechai, oh, the Aura Mordechai. So that's the Bracha Haman. What's the Aura Mordechai? The Aura Mordechai, which I gave a shir many years ago, was that really Mashiach was supposed to come. And the, 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 the Canaan told Mordechai, don't interfere and let Klai Yisrael be destroyed. Because if Klai Yisrael would have been destroyed by Haman, then a second later they would have all come back to life and Mashiach would have come. And Mordechai, and that's why it says at the end of the Megillah that only some of Klai Yisrael were happy about what he did. Right? What's the word? Ratzoy l'roiv echav. He was accepted by most of his brothers. So they asked the Kausha. He just saved everybody. He should be accepted by all his brothers. So it says Bezdin did not accept him. So there's two reasons. One, that he stayed in the government. But the other one, the Zayar says that really, if you would have let it just be, if you would have let it just be, Mashiach would have come. And they told him to let it just be. But Mordechai said, I'm the leader. I'm the Yemi Yahu. I'm the Shayahu. I'm the Noach of the generation. I, it's not my job to bring that Mashiach should come. My job as the leader is to save Klai Yisrael. And therefore, I'm not, I'm not letting the Jews get killed. And I will do whatever I can to save Klai Yisrael. That's what it says, Rove. Not everybody agreed with what he did. So it says, 
that there's a little bit or a marachai. That at the end of the day, you're right, you saved Clive Shaw, but at the end of the day, we lost six million, and we had crusades, and we had Spanish Inquisition, and all that would not have happened had Mashiach come. So you did the right thing, and Clive Shaw was saved, but at the end of the day, there's a teeny bit not Hakar Satay. Because the greatest Hakar Satay would have been if you brought Mashiach. For that, you have to be drunk. In this world, you can't say Oror Monachai. The bottom line is he saved us. In the other world, after you drink, there's a little Oror, there's a little Oror Monachai and a little Baruch Because the whole Purim is based on Hakar Satayv. So what we, have to, what we have to work on until Purim, we have to work on to, through Adah, we have to work on Purim Day is to, is to turn Purim Day into a day of thank yous, I love yous, appreciating our parents, appreciating our wives, appreciating our children, appreciating our rebbeim, our friends, the poor people, of course, our Kosh Baruch Hu at the top, and last but not least, Su'udas Purim, our family. May it all be to see the Beis HaMikdash, we may have the Amen or Amen. Okay, so anyway, just to, just to wrap it up, so uh, as far as our Kosh Baruch so it's connected also to Yisrael. What happened? Yisro, it says that when did, Yisro, when did Yisro come to Klai Yisro? After he heard Muhammad Amalek, right? And he heard Kriyas Yamsuf. Why those two? Rashi says, why those two? She says the same thing, based on the same thing. What happened? Yisro heard that, that there was Kriyas Yamsuf, and then there was a Muhammad, there was Muhammad Amalek right after they came out. How's Muhammad Amalek? So he said like this. He said, Muhammad Amalek, right? They went to war against Amalek, and they won, right? And they had Kriyas Yamsuf, and they won. So he said... One second. Klai Yisrael could have fought the Mitzrayim. Why do you have to have a Kriyas Yamsuf? If they could beat Amalek, they could have gone to war in Mitzrayim. With, with, we see there were great warriors. They, Hashem fought for them, but they, they beat Amalek. So they could have gone in Mitzrayim. But they didn't go in Mitzrayim. They didn't go to fight in Mitzrayim. So when he heard, Muhammad Amalek, one second, they wiped out the strongest army in the world. So why did they have to have Kriyas Yamsuf? Why, why couldn't they go to war against Mitzrayim? So the Teretz is amazing. If you look at, if you look at Kriyas Yamsuf, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Ba'atem tacharishan, you guys sit here and do nothing, and I'll fight for you. So they asked the Kasha, why? And the Teretz is, Hashem said, you cannot go to war and kill Mitzrayim, the Jew lived in their land, and you ate their food. Therefore, if I allow you to kill the Mitzrayim, to go to war against the Mitzrayim, you're going to be killing people that, that the Maitre, you were there above them. They took your children and they threw them into the Amsof. They killed your kids, right? They killed your kids. They made you slaves. But at the end of the day, you ate their food. You lived in their houses. You lived in their land. You are not allowed to kill them because that is not a Satoy. That's a Kafuitan. So Kosh Baruch says, when it comes to the Mitzrayim, I kill them. Atem Tacharishan, you don't lift a finger against a person that you live by him even as a slave. When it comes to Amalek, you kill them. Because Amalek was no Hakar Satayv too. So when he heard Kriyas Yamsuf, when it came to the Yamsuf, he didn't let the Jews kill them. Amalchamas Amalek, Hashem let the Jews kill them. He said, ah, this is a nation that you don't, you can't even, that God doesn't even allow you to kill the person who killed your children, who, who, who made you an event because you lived in their land as a servant? That's a nation I want to become part of. So Yisra, when he heard, Muhammad Amalek and Kriyas Yamsuf, that's when he said, I want to go to Moshe, I want to become. So it was all based on Hakar Satayv. He says, and that was the end of Mitzrayim. What happened with Mitzrayim? Mitzrayim was doing great. Mitzrayim had Yosef. And what, what happened? The beginning of Shemos is the, is the beginning of the end of Mitzrayim, right? They got the, they got the, um, they got the Shemos, they got the, the Erebo, they got the, the, the Makis, they got destroyed in the Yamsuf. What did it say in the beginning of Shemos? And this is just connected to Purim. Everything is great. spreading out. Everything is great. What happens? What's the end of Mitzrayim? Why was Mitzrayim wiped out? By Yakum, Melech. Chodosh, Amitrayim, Asher, Lo, Yoda, Es Yosef. Yosef HaTzadik saved the world, saved Mitzrayim. The whole Mitzrayim became an empire because of the food. And then they couldn't pay, the seven years that he put it away, so they couldn't pay for the food. They took everybody's money. 
They ran out of money. So now they came to Yosef two years in the famine. They're like, we don't have money. You're going to let us starve? He says, you have land? You have land? Give me your land. They gave him all the land. He gave them food. In the fourth year, fifth year, they had no more land. They had no more money. He said, now what are you going to do? He says, if you all about them, sell yourselves as servants. I'll give you to eat. So they all became servants. And people came from all over the world, says the Medrash, and sold themselves as servants so that they would have what to eat. They wouldn't starve. So the whole empire of Mitzrayim was created by Yosef HaTzadik. So the, the, the Rashi says, the Lord Yoda, they forgot, he forgot, right? They forgot who Yosef was. One says, the Yoka Melech really a new king. And the other one says, the old king, but he forgot. Says that Kaddish Baruch a nation, a nation. It was the only nation that was wiped out. There wasn't one mitzri left. A nation that after a man creates your whole empire, and you knew him, and you forgot him, you're a coffee tithe, this nation doesn't, cannot be leading the world anymore. This cannot be leading the world. They have to be totally destroyed. And a nation that, that, that the, there's a new king. It's not a new king, right? The old king died. But he knew. He came into a kingdom that was built by Yosef HaTzadik. Everything he had came from Yosef HaTzadik. And he forgot him. By Yochum El Chadash. And he forgot him. Such a nation that is a kafli tov cannot be in the world. Haman, who's a kafli tov, who's willing to kill the house of Shaul that saved his life, him and his children, there can't be anybody left from Haman. They have to all be destroyed. That midah of being a kafli tov of, of not appreciating, it's even worse, I don't know the word, English words for it, right? Not appreciating what people do for you, that is a mina that a Kodesh Baruch will, 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 not allow, will, not, will not allow. Timcha ezecher amolei. Timcha you have to wipe out Haman. That, what's wiping out Haman? Wiping out that mida of not appreciating. Not appreciating your parents, not appreciating people who do for you, not appreciating God that does for you. Non-appreciation, that destroyed Mitzrayim, that destroyed Haman, and that's what Klai Yisrael has to work on 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 Purim. Hakaras Hatoyev through all the four mitzvahs that we have: Suda and 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 Shachmanis and Matanas Avyanim and of course Mikra Megillah. Slach Rabbah.